Shalom. Welcome to Monday School. As we get started, we're going to be in Acts chapter 18, the first 18 verses. As we get started, I'd like to invite you to join me in prayer. Our Father, our God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for every opportunity that we have to open your word, that we have the freedom to do so, we have the instruction to do so, we have the availability to do so, and for that we give you thanks. We thank you for sending Jesus Christ into this world, and that he changed things, that as, as people drew near to him, he caused them to see you. And for that, we are thankful that as we join together in study, our hearts go as well to those who are near and dear to our hearts and minds, um, among them being Sadie in Virginia and David Hawkins, also in Virginia. We thank you for the way that you have prospered, Katie. We ask that your touch would be upon David, that you would help him as he struggles. We ask for David's uh, neighbor, for David Doneski's neighbor. Uh, we ask that your touch would be upon him. We ask as well upon his uh, brother-in-law, Larry, that you would bring healing um, and we also think of uh, Tina's brother-in-law, Ken Dills, who needs a touch from above. And uh, we commit all these into your hands and ask, O oh Lord, that you would, would uh, deliver them from the difficulties they are presently facing and assure them of your presence and power. Now we ask that you would teach us that by your Holy Spirit you would enable us to not only read and understand your word, but to get a clear idea of where we fit in the picture of salvation history and of our, um, our place in the world as far as how you want us to be involved in evangelizing this world. Once again, thank you for salvation in and through Jesus Christ. And we ask it in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior. Amen. So, Acts chapter 18. I'm going to read the first 18 verses. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid. 
Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. Then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul. And Gallio showed no concern whatever. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Sancria because of a vow he had taken. So we have here a narrative of what is going on in Paul's ministry. And it begins with this cryptic uh, wording, after this. After what? And to find out what, you go back and read chapter 17. And basically, chapter 17 is about Paul's ministry in Athens, that he went to Athens. And I won't go into great detail, but just to, to uh, sort of give you the, the Reader's Digest version that while he was there, he, he saw an enormous number of idols that were to every imaginable god. And among the things that he saw was a, a um, marker, a stone tablet that was inscribed to the unknown god. And Paul was looking for an opportunity to preach the gospel, and that's all it took. Is He said, I saw, I see, first of all, he starts out, and it's interesting, his approach, because sometimes we think of Paul being kind of a, uh, you know, sort of ram his head through the wall kind of guy, that he is the irresistible force that is ready to take on the immovable object. But in this case, he's really wise in the way that he approaches them. He says, I notice that you're very religious. Instead of saying, you're scandalously idolatrous and getting them uh, on edge, that he says, I see that you're very religious people. Oh, here's a reasonable man. We can listen to him. He says, I even saw one of your idols that is inscribed to the unknown God, and I'm here to tell you who that is. And then he preached Christ to them and uh, got a pretty good listening in the Areopagus uh, up until the time that he began to speak about the resurrection. And it was at that point there were some who believed but then there were others who began to mock and uh, began to dismiss and to be sort of troublemakers. And so it was in the aftermath of that that Paul goes to Corinth. So Paul left Athens, went to Corinth, and there he met a Jew named Aquila, 
a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Why had he recently come to Corinth? And we're told, because Claudius, the emperor, that because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Now, an interesting thing about this is remember that the Roman world has been tied together with the Roman road system. And their intent was to make travel between cities much easier for military purposes, much like our interstate system in the U.S. in the 50s was designed to facilitate military use. That is why highways that used to be somewhat winding were straightened out. Uh, they made better runways when they were straight. And even though it hasn't become necessary to use the highways in that manner, that's what the intent was. Well, in, in the Roman world, that uh, they, they paved roads that otherwise would not have been passable at all times. They made their roadways passable so that they could send troops wherever they wanted to get them in a minimum of time. They were able to mobilize their military because of their road system. Inadvertently, they also built a great system that allowed people to move more easily from city to city. And particularly when Claudius, the emperor, kicks the Jews out of Rome, they scatter and they can go anywhere within the, the realm of the, the Roman government. What this reminds me of, I shared this with the live class, it reminds me of the San Francisco earthquake. And uh, most people, maybe not here, but especially in California, they're keenly aware uh, that when you talk about the San Francisco earthquake, you also talk about the fire that the city of San Francisco burned to the ground. There was very little left after the earthquake. And of course, it's not unusual for fires to break out after earthquakes because the gas lines are ruptured. And the first time that somebody tries to uh, light a fire for heating or cooking purposes, it sets something off and there you go the fire begins. So in order to keep fires from spreading, the San Francisco Fire Department of 1906 uh, went into con consultation with one another and somebody came up with the brilliant idea and I think it's one of these things of my brother-in-law says, uh, but uh, that they were going to try to create a fire break between where the fire was actively burning and the areas that, that the hope was that despite the windy conditions that are typical in the San Francisco area, that if they would create a break in which um, that basically they were going to destroy structures and burn them in place so that if the fire came that direction that it would run out of fuel and be extinguished. The other thing is that explosives had, they were sort of new on the scene and, and people had figured out that there were situations in which explosives would use up so much oxygen that ongoing fires would be extinguished. So they handed out dynamite and 
instructed their firemen uh, where to to blow up the buildings they had a glorious plan of a pattern in which to destroy the buildings so that the fire would not destroy the rest of the city unfortunately they didn't do a good job of instructing the people that they gave the explosives to who were not experienced at this they didn't give them adequate instruction as to how much dynamite to use and so the it, it sounds like they read the Cannon family <laughs> recipe for how to make something work if some is good more is better and so they in their their desire to try and put the fire out they used too much in the way of explosives and they ended up spreading the fire everywhere and the reason why the San Francisco fire was so disastrous is because of a failed effort to contain it that they didn't know what they were doing well Claudius as Emperor of Rome was trying to contain Christianity he was trying to keep it from being spread in in Rome the center of his uh, kingdom his realm and uh, that if you read the history the secular history of Rome of that time you hear references to a Jewish prophet Crestus over whom there were uh, disagreements and riots among the Jews and so to get rid of the problem Claudius says all the Jews need to leave the city and they scattered throughout the kingdom and as they did they took with them maybe some aspects of the debate over who is Jesus but in the process the gospel was declared and and it kick-started the the Christian movement uh, to to spread throughout the kingdom and part of that spreading is Aquila and Priscilla who have moved to Corinth now Corinth is is not this is the Las Vegas of that era it is sin city that if there is anything immoral going on it's in Corinth but it's also a great uh, center for monetary exchange for trading in goods and services so it's not a bad place to try to minister there are going to be a lot of people and there are people on the move so it's the ideal way to spread the news about Jesus Christ so Paul goes to meet with Asilla uh, with with Aquila and Priscilla and because they are both tent makers that both Aquila and Priscilla are tent makers and Paul is a tent maker and they begin to work together now it says they stayed and worked together one of the things to to be clear it's not like they said hey we've got an extra bedroom why don't you stay at our house that's not the way that it worked that it was not unusual for different guilds uh, groups that did a particular kind of work to occupy a common building that had a courtyard where the work was actually done and then the living areas would be either on a second floor or on a less in a less prominent area but that the central courtyard is where the work would be done and also where goods might be 
sold. So Paul and Aquila and Priscilla working together in close proximity, you can just imagine the way that their daily conversations went as they are working on the tents in addition to the communication that was necessary for them to get the tents properly constructed, that you've got to believe that Paul is teaching and Aquila and Priscilla are listening. And we will find Aquila and Priscilla showing up throughout uh, the the letters of Paul, they're going to pop up here, there, and the other place. They were very influential in helping the spread of the gospel. And that every Sabbath, he, Paul, reasoned in the synagogue. And the literal word there is lectured. In other words, that he presented his verbal understanding, I guess I should say it this way, he presented his understanding of the scriptures verbally. Um, and, and in the process was trying to persuade Jew, Jews and Greeks about the gospel of Christ. Now, when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching. So up until that time, he was a bivocational preacher. He preached when he got the opportunity. He made tents as necessary to cover his living expenses. Uh, but when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, and the implication is that they may have brought something in the way of an offering, or they had other means of providing support to Paul that enabled him to devote himself exclusively to the proclamation of the gospel to the Jews, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. So who is Paul ministering to at this point? Primarily to the Jews. But, Verse 6, when they opposed Paul and became abusive, and the word translated abusive here is, it's a transliteration of the Greek word for blasphemy. That they became blasphemous. That they weren't just mildly opposed or saying, now take it easy there. This is out and out blasphemy. That when that was what they resorted to, it says Paul shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So, what is Paul doing? I invite you to look at Ezekiel chapter 33. And I'm just going to read some of this. This helps put that in context. Because when you read that initially, you kind of go, Man, Paul, you're getting a little bit harsh, aren't you? Your blood be upon your own head? That's... that's Sounds pretty rough. Ezekiel 33, starting with verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, speak to your people and say to them, If I bring the sword upon a land and the people of the land take a man from among them and make him their watchman, and if he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows the trumpet and warns the people... Then if anyone who hears the sound of the trumpet does not take the warning and the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. Does this sound familiar? Verse 5. 
he heard the sound of the trumpet and did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But if he had taken warning, he would have saved his life. Verse 6, but if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet so that the people are not warned and the sword comes and takes any one of them, that person is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way, that wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn away from his way, and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. What's going on in Ezekiel? That the prophet has been told by God, when I instruct you to warn people about what is coming, that if you warn them, but they refuse to listen, that's on them. Their blood is on their head. Get the connection here? Paul is saying, I have been called by God to warn you. To first of all, warn you that you are in your sins. You stand ready to be judged for your iniquity. But God has provided a way. In and through the finished work of Jesus Christ, God has provided a way for you to be delivered from your sins. And if you take heed to what I am saying, you will be saved. But if you choose to ignore what I am teaching you, then your blood is on your own head. It's not on me. I've done what I have been called to do, to deliver the message, to shout out the warning. The sword is on its way. And so it is when you hear a preacher who is passionately delivering a warning that people need to change their ways. This is the basis for it. That it's not just a style. It's not just a pattern. It is direction from God. And Paul was delivering that message to the Jews in Corinth. But they kicked him out. And when they did, Paul said, From now on, I will go to the Gentiles, and your blood will be on your own head. This is on you, not on me. So, verse 7, Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. That's pretty convenient, isn't it? Well, God sets things up sometimes so that they work out exactly how he wants them to work. And Crispus, the synagogue leader and his entire household, believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. Now, when you read about Crispus, and I will invite you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse 14, and Paul is describing how uh, he did ministry 
and he's in the the process of describing how there are some people who say, "Oh, I'm I'm a, of Peter," and others are saying, "I'm of Paul," and others, "I'm of Apollos," and and there are some who are saying, "I'm of Jesus," and uh, that there are these debates that began to rage. And then Paul says, I'm glad that I didn't baptize any of you except, and then he mentions Crispus by name. That Crispus was a non-believer before he heard the teaching of Paul, and on the basis of Paul's teaching, he sought to be publicly identified with Jesus Christ by what we call believer's baptism. So, Uh, Crispus became a believer, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. Now, whenever you're accomplishing something, it's not unusual for trouble to arise. And even though trouble has not yet arisen that we're told of, other than a little bit of upset in the synagogue, rejection of the message, if it, you will, in verse 9 it says, One night... The Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. God is giving him assurance. And sometimes it's almost like he's making a deposit in the bank ahead of time. There's something coming, and you're going to need this fund in the future. Right now you may not need it, but the day is coming when you will. Or there might have been something going on that we're not given total detail that Paul was, was fearful and God is giving him assurance. And uh, the form of the assurance, verse 10, for I am with you. I am with you. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. That with us, God. <coughs> Excuse me. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. God is saying, I've got it. I've got this, Paul. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half. He was used to sort of bouncing around, and when things got rough, he went somewhere that was more open. He didn't stay and, quote, fight, even though there are times when he got beat up, times when he was arrested, and, and that it, it was most appropriate for him to leave town. In this case, God is saying, assuring Paul, I need you to stay in Corinth and face the music. I need you to stay here. So he is there for a year and a half. That's time for a pretty good foundation to be laid spiritually for the church. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul. Now it's interesting, this proconsul, Gallio, uh, we know to be a historical person. This is verified in secular history. Now, the interesting thing is secular history can't tie down exactly when he was in that position. It was either 49 to 50 A.D. or 52 to 53, I believe, are the numbers that are generally put in. And that when somebody was appointed proconsul, they were to serve for two years. That was it. And then they were moved on someplace else. And so Paul is brought there to be judged, and basically the proconsul says, you're asking me to make judgment on things that are none of my business. That the Jews apparently are trying to say, he's, he's, trying, he's teaching people to break the law. And what they're really hoping is that the proconsul will jump in there and say, don't do that. And the proconsul instead is sort of saying, I don't know anything about your laws, but I don't see anything that's against Roman law, so leave me alone. 
and he pushes them out. Having done so, then the crowd turns on the new synagogue leader, whose name is Sosthenes, and they beat him up. And apparently the reason they beat him up is they don't feel like he's been extreme enough in his rejection of what Paul is teaching. And in fact, there, is, there are hints that Sosthenes eventually becomes a believer in Jesus Christ. So Paul stays in Corinth for a while, then he left for Syria with Priscilla and Aquila, and it's kind of interesting there. Up to now, we've been talking about Aquila and Priscilla, and by the time we get to the, the 18th verse, it's Priscilla and Aquila, and, she's, and that's how it, it's usually referred, her first, then Aquila. More on that later. But anyway, Paul is now on his way toward Jerusalem. He has cut his hair as part of a vow that is going to be fulfilled with worship at the temple in Jerusalem. So, uh, I, I know there's a lot of information here. I want to encourage you to read it, drink it in, and be assured that God is calling us all to be faithful in declaring the good news of Jesus Christ. And I'll leave you just with this last bit of encouragement. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. Father in heaven, enable us to fulfill the Great Commission in accordance with the way you would have us work it out. In Jesus' name, amen. Shalom, uvracha.